Hello judges, audience members, and fellow contestants. My name is Haneen Akram and I have a statement I think you should all hear. Every American citizen needs to have health insurance. There is a large amount of hardworking Americans who don't have health insurance. These people make up 11.3% of the US population. But do you really know what that means? It means there are 44 million people in the US who don't have health insurance plus 38 million people who have insufficient health care. This adds up to 82 million people in the US who either have insufficient health care or don't have health care at all. But why is it so important for these millions and millions of Americans to be covered by some type of health insurance? Well, first of all, it can be life-saving. A lot of people refrain from seeing the doctor because they don't have health insurance, which leads me to my next point. Many people are diagnosed with illnesses, but some are diagnosed too late. They don't see the doctor for a checkup and find out later about their illness and receive words from the doctor which might be, if we had known earlier, we would have been able to do something. Almost half of cancer patients are diagnosed too late, which lowers the chances of treatment being successful. But if all Americans have health insurance, they'll visit the doctor more often and unnecessary deaths will be prevented. This can also help our population grow, which could benefit the country. Secondly. The U.S. doesn't provide universal coverage for its citizens. There are places without an economy as strong as ours and are still able to give their citizens universal coverage. For example, Switzerland spent half of what we spent, and Singapore only spent one-fifth of what we spent, and they've both given their people universal coverage. In 2015, the U.S. ranked 12th on the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom. Each country is ranked based off a of freedom score. They get this score by looking at things like rule of law, property rights, and more. It shows how much economic freedom a country gives to its citizens. Singapore ranked second, while Switzerland ranked fifth. Our freedom score was a 76.2, while the top ranking country, Hong Kong, had an 89.6. Out of the top 12 countries on the list, we were only one of two who don't provide universal coverage for, us, for our citizens. This only goes to show that having universal coverage can boost our freedom score and potentially rank us higher on the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom. Lastly, hardworking Americans don't get the health insurance they deserve. Many Americans work for hours and some are barely able to pay their bills with the money they make. Our fellow citizens should be living stress-free lives but instead are overwhelmed with bills plus the fact that they don't have health insurance, which could be risking their lives. On top of their own health insurance and struggling to pay bills, some have to worry about their kids. Their children might not have health insurance either, which only causes more stress and takes more time from their busy day. These people contribute so much to our society and can't even have peace of mind, which is just one more reason all Americans need to have health insurance. But you may be wondering, how is this speech patriotic in any way? Well, one way patriotism can be defined is devotion to the welfare of one's fellow citizen, or in this case, citizens. The U.S. should provide universal coverage so that the 44 million Americans without it are covered health-wise. It can prevent many deaths, rank us higher on the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom, and give all our amazing citizens what they deserve. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Arzu Sabir, and I'm in eighth grade, and I'm here from Cheyenne Elementary School. Martin Luther King Jr., this man started a legacy that ended up becoming worldwide. He made it possible for everyone to be at peace with one another. Martin inspires me to this day to accept others for who they are, not what they look like. He gave us equal rights and equal freedom. In my heart, a true patriot, a true American hero who lies there is Martin Luther King Jr. 
And now you're saying, Arzu, what did Martin Luther King Jr. do that was so important? Well, he put a big end to segregation, a real big end. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January 15, 1929 in Atlantic, Georgia. As he grew up in 1944, Martin Luther King Jr. graduated Booker T. Washington High School, married Creta Scott, and settled in Montgomery, Alabama. Let me begin with a quote by Martin Luther King Jr., also known as the I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will join hands with little white boys and little white girls. As sister and brother, I have a dream today. More adventured his life trying to bring our freedom and justice that we all have today. You parents, you judges, you boys and girls are in this room together, in this room because of this man, Martin Luther King Jr. Through his many speeches, nonviolent boycotts, and peaceful marches, he led thousands of people, not just in America, but worldwide, to, the, to spread the message of freedom and equality. He believed that all men are created equal. And with just that one phrase, he banded thousands of people at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, where he spoke those very words. I have a dream that one of this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But sadly, Martin Luther King Jr. died on April 4, 1968, while standing on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee at 6, 1 p.m. As we know more and more about Martin Luther King Jr., we all know he had a dream. Martin Luther King Jr. is one man who forever revolutionized the lives of thousands of people in the United States. He dreamed of a peaceful world where everyone was treated alike, no matter their social background or race. During his almost 40 years on this earth, he saw a way to end the horrible consequences brought on racial discrimination. On that very day, he spoke in front of 250,000 people, forever spreading the message of freedom, equality, and love. He gave us the right and freedom and to enjoy life. He gave us a chance to soar our wings, to reach the stars, and to be on top of the world. Thank you. You're a woman walking down the street. In the distance, you see a group of four black men. Your heart starts racing. Bum, 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 bum. Your hands clench onto your purse. Why? This is because you are afraid. Afraid that they were the typical racial stereotype. Good morning, judges, guests, and fellow contestants. Racial stereotypes are a big problem in America. Um, racial stereotypes are not only effective to black people. They are affected to Latinos, for example. All Mexicans are immigrants and sell cocaine, right? All Irish are drunks and all Asians are bad drivers. So why as human beings are we stereotypical? This is because our brains are designed to pick up patterns. If you see a black man who has a woman in a movie, you're going to pick up that pattern and believe this in real life. The more you know people, the more open-minded you're about them. The more you start noticing all blacks are not the same, all Asians are not the same, our Latinos are not the same. <clears throat> Even though this concept applies to many people, there are still a few rotten apples in the apple tree. These are no more uh, stereotypes and now are racist. Let's take it back, take it way back. What is racism? To put racism in my own words, it's when you make a judgment about someone based on their skin color or race. Why did I put race in quotations? This is because it's not real. It is a social concept made up to divide human beings based on where they come from. But now we just seem to judge it more and more our skin color. Um, Robert Sussman once said, racism is not born, it is taught, an ideology. 
This can be fixed by parents teaching their children to be more open at a young age. So how can we fix this? Racism is like a child afraid of the dark. If you push a child into a dark room, expecting it to fix its own problems, that's not going to work. First, you seek to understand why it is a problem, and then proceed to fix it. Racism is a big problem in America. The criminal justice system applies to this act of racism without even knowing it. Stop and Frisk of NYPD, also known as Terry Stopped, frisked 100,000 people a year for a 10-year period, from 2003 to 2013. This was targeted to black Americans and Latinos in neighborhoods of poverty. So how can we fix this again? Learn to learn to be more open from everyone. Even if you're an adult, it doesn't matter. You could always be more open to new people. Don't close yourself captive, not being open, because this is a huge problem. This causes many bad things, such as racism. This is not the only problem in America, but at least we could fix it. Take a moment to think and be honest with yourself. How often do you look in the mirror and think, if I could just lose 10 pounds, then I could be happy? That model you saw as slim, pretty, something you wanted to be, has been struggling with anorexia. We often look at that girl as beautiful, perfect, and the ideal body, when in reality, she is unhealthy, unhappy, and depressed. In today's society, Women are expected to please the media with the perfect jean size, slim waist, and the perfect breast. Now let's be real. Is that the way we should be portraying women? We all have different or similar definitions of patriotism. However, my definition is respecting one another. Respecting one another regardless of their background, race, religion, or gender. She's not skinny enough. She's too tall. Her hips are too wide. Does that sound like the words of respect? Does that sound like patriotism? Women and young girls are now living in an age where their bodies define who they are. They are exposed to an unattainable body image through magazines, social media, and television. We all are different, therefore it is unrealistic to represent only one body image as beautiful. Young girls and women are insecure about their bodies. They feel it would be better if they changed, not only for themselves, but for others. A recent survey found that only 2% of women in the world describe themselves as beautiful. Body dysmorphic disorder. It's a disorder of imagined ugliness, where people see themselves as ugly rather than what they really look like. They focus on their real or perceived flaws. People who suffer from this isolate themselves from fear others people will notice those flaws. Depression is a more common disorder where people are unhappy about their appearance and they are sad, hopeless, and unable to live life normally. The media needs to stop encouraging women to have impossible ideals of beauty. Instead of focusing on being Instead of spending time obsessing over your outer self, focus on your education, hobbies, and socializing. Tell someone they look great today. It may seem simple, but it goes a long way. It's not about working for yourself, but it's about working for the good of others. There is a lot of ways to demonstrate patriotism. Yes, waving the flag is one. Saying the speech is one. <sighs> But it's more than that. It's showing love and respect for your country, not only for your country, but the people in it, the people that make us who we are today. Changing our world starts with you. Be the one to change a perspective, a life, and a mindset.
Every four years, when the time comes to elect a new president in November, there 42% of people choose not to cast in their ballots. In doing so, they sacrifice an opportunity to share their views. They sacrifice a voice that has the power to change history. They think that voting means nothing, even though so many people fought for the right to vote. Voting is important and defines a true patriot. Voting gives you a voice, a voice you should take advantage of. Voting lets you share your views and opinions. It lets you, take a, it lets you be a part of our democracy. The government needs your vote. Voting lets you take control of your future. When, when you vote, you may find yourself more knowledgeable on the current events and, and the world around you when you vote. To make a decision on what to vote for, you need, you need to learn new information about that topic. So when you vote, you're getting a better understanding and learning more about what is going on around you. Which ties into my next point, point about the patriots of the past. Susan B. Anthony was denied a trial, thrown into jail, and fined just for trying to vote. Suffragists were imprisoned in a workhouse, beaten and abused. Martin Luther King Jr. was thrown in jail 29 times for what they called civil disobedience. Throughout history, people fought for the right to vote. In 1848, the women's suffrage movement began, but it wasn't until 1920 the women's suffrage movement succeeded. They fought for 72 years just to vote. And it wasn't just them either. It wasn't until 1870 African American men got the right to vote. And in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. Many, voting meant a great deal to people, and many sacrifices were made. So it should mean a great deal to you. It may not seem like voting could change so much but it does. And sure, we may not always get what we want when we vote, but that doesn't mean your vote is less important. It just means you have to work harder for what you believe in. And just like the patriots of the past, you can be a patriot of the future. So do what's important and vote. Do you consider yourself a patriot? Would you serve your country like Mary Owens or Jenny Hodgers, even though you weren't supposed to? Hello, my name is Peyton Brooks Cosby, and this is my patriotic speech. On April 12th of 1861, the Civil War was started, and women were forbidden from fighting in the war. But that didn't stop many of them. In fact, there was about 400 women who dressed up as men and fought and there's an estimate of about 250 of those women being on the Confederate side. One example of these women is Mary Owens. Mary Owens was born in Wales, but immigrated to Pennsylvania. She married William Evans, even though her parents disliked him. And during the time of the Civil War, Mary was a Union soldier, and with her regiment, served in three battles. Her husband died by her side, and so to avenge him, she kept fighting. In each battle, Mary was wounded. In her third battle, she was wounded in the chest. This led to her discovery. She was honorably discharged after 18 months and was given the nickname, the heroine of the neighborhood. I believe that this woman is a patriot because of the sacrifices she made to serve her country. Another, one, another example of these women, woman, women, is Jenny Hodgers. Jenny Hodgers was born in December of 1843 in Ireland. In 1862, she lived in Illinois and enlisted in the 95th Illinois Infantry. Even though she was the shortest in her regiment, she was still considered one of the boys and a good soldier. 
Her regiment was a part of the Army of Tennessee and took part in 40 engagements, such as the Siege of Vicksburg and the Battle of Nashville. She served a full three years of enlistment before 1864 after losing 289 soldiers. In, f in one case, she was captured, but she managed to overpower her prison guard and escape. And finally, we have Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sarah Emma Edmonds was born in New Brunswick. And at the age of 15, she left the family farm to an escape a young marriage. Her mother assisted her with her escape. When Sarah got into the US, she became a Bible bookseller and publisher in Connecticut. She was inspired by many of the books she read, speaking of heroics and bravery. That's why in May of 1861, she enlisted in the 2nd Michigan Infantry, also known as the Flint Union Grays. She felt it was her duty to serve her country, her new country. At first, she was a field nurse, taking part in several campaigns with General McClellan. But wanting more action, she became a spy. In one case, while spying in Virginia, a friend of hers was caught and discovered. This friend was killed by firing squad. Then in an ambush, she took the opening spot and avenged her fallen friend. These women are patriots. They fought. They lived for something bigger than themselves. They inspire me to go out to the field, to be brave like them. That's why when I finish high school and college, I'm going to the Air Force to become a para-jumper, which is kind of like the special ops for the Air Force. Why? Because I want to be a patriot too. Some will say that I can't do it, but because of these women, I know I can. And so again, I ask you, do you consider yourself to be a patriot? Thank you. I ask that everyone look at the flag. What do you see? Well, when I look at it, I see a piece of material covered in red and white stripes, a blue square, and white stars. But the one question that pops into my head is, what is the meaning behind those numerous threads? And why do we display it so proudly? Good afternoon, judges, parents, guests, and fellow contestants. My name is Sierra Nelson. On June 14, 1777, the Continental Congress passed an act establishing an official flag for our new nation. The resolve stated, the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white. Let that the Union be 13 stars, white, in a field of blue, representing a new constellation. And so, our flag was born. Historians believe it was designed by New Jersey Congressman Francis Hopkinson and sewn by Philadelphia seamstress Betsy Ross. As America grew as a nation, the number of flags on our star, on, <laughs> of, on stars on our flag changed, but the story it represents didn't, and it never will. I believe this was best said by one of our senators, John Thune. He said, I believe our flag is more than just cloth and ink. It is a universally recognized symbol that stands for liberty and freedom. It is the history of our nation, and it is marked by the blood of those who died defending it. On October 19, 1781, in Yorktown, Virginia, marked the final day of the American Revolution and the day America gained its independence from Great Britain. After countless battles, wounded soldiers, and endless determination, the American Continental Army, led by George Washington, were able to wave our nation's flag in the sky and proudly say, the land of the free. 
When I think of our nation's flag, I automatically think of the millions of men and women who died fighting or fought to protect and serve our country. Well, during the Battle of Iwo Jima, they too had the same mindset. In February of 1945, three U.S. Marine divisions landed on the island of Iwo Jima during World War II. Iwo Jima was defended by an estimated amount of 23,000 Japanese Army and Navy troops and was attacked by our three Marine divisions after elaborate preparatory and planning. Of course, this deserves endless amount of honor and praise, but that wasn't what caught everyone's attention. What became a very well-known photograph was what photographer Joe Rosenthal captured at the top of Mount Suribachi. The photograph showed five Marines and one Navy corpsman struggling to lift the heavy pole. What made this photo so incredible was that it was not planned nor staged. They were simply raising our flag to honor the fighting and the fallen. Our flag doesn't just represent the millions of people who serve to protect our country, but also the billions of people that make up our country. It represents the love, the pride, and the gratitude we share to display such a magnificent and beautiful piece of our nation. Our flag isn't just cloth and ink. It represents what America was what it is, and what it will be. Thank you for your time. Many people don't know of where, of where segregation and slavery originally came from. Hello, fellow judges, audience, and fellow contestants. I'm Aspen Wolf. One of the most well-known wars in our American history was the Civil War. Many people had challenges during those times, and slaves was a group of people that had those hard challenges. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation during this period. There has been a major change from 1619 when slavery started and today. A man named William Box, Box Brown, a slave in Richmond, who lived and worked on a tobacco plantation, once said in his book, The Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown, he was a very mean man in all of his ways, and he was very much disliked by the slaves. He used to whip them often in a shameful manner. One day, he took a slave by the name of Pinckney and made him take off his shirt, giving him 100 lashes to the bare back, all because he lacked three pounds of his task, which was only valued at six cents. The Emancipation Proclamation stopped these tragic events from happening on January 1st, 1863. One of our biggest documents, the Emancipation Proclamation, took effect in certain southern states. This was not against the border states because they had done nothing against the Union, so they had no reason to put this upon them. If you had slaves in the designated states, it was considered a crime. The daily life of a slave was extremely harsh. If you were a slave that worked in the field, you had little amounts of food, poor living and working conditions, and the worst personal treatment, whether it was bathing, brushing your hair, or even just having good clothes. If you were a house slave, you had better living and working conditions, but it still wasn't free. Any slave at any time was able to be beat or lashed. The Reconstructional Amendments played a big part in the Emancipation Proclamation, especially the 13th Amendment. The quote, the quote, where slavery is, their liberty cannot be, and where liberty is, their slavery cannot be, was said by Abraham Lincoln. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments helped give liberty to the millions of slaves across the United States. Eric Williams once said, slavery was not born of racism, rather racism was the consequence of slavery. Slavery was first based off an economic system. Now, slavery is viewed today as a, as a judgment of African Americans to be lower in class in humanity. 37 years after the Emancipation Proclamation came into play, segregation was starting in the United States. 
Segregation was the separation of whites and colored among places. Martin Luther King Jr. helped put a stop to this. On August 28th, 1963, he gave his famous speech named, I have a dream. I have a dream that one day my four children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And to believe that this quote came true, for we do not have segregation today. Ezra Pound, the poet, once said, a slave is one who waits for someone to come and free him. On September 22nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln gave his famous speech and said, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves are, and said designated states and parts of states are henceforth shall be free. This is when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation and declared that all slaves would be free on January 1st, 1863. The Emancipation Proclamation is a very important document to the United States to this very day. It aimed the war in a different direction. Now is not only to preserve the Union, but to free the slaves. Today, slavery is abolished and viewed as a crime. As America has grown, we have become more and more diverse as people enter our free country. The progression of the country has come a very long way, but still has a long way to go. As I grow older, I am seeing racism grow within our country. On the news, I'm constantly reminded of the division between our people. I want to be the person to speak out against this and bring back what holds us together. We're all people that bleed the same. We can't look at the differences in our parents, but how we are all humans that live on this earth. As Kofi Annan once said, we may have different religions, different languages, different colored skin, but we are all belong to one human race. We all share the same basic values. Thank you. America really is a land of immigrants. In fact, it would not be the same without them. Diversity shall not separate us as a nation but it should in fact bring us together as we embrace each other's ethnicities. Welcome fellow contestants, special guests, and judges. My name is Jasmine Puffer, and I'm here to tell you what I would say to someone looking forward to immigrating to the US. So to those seeking to immigrate to America, I would like to tell you, it really is a land of opportunities if you do it legally and appropriately. America offers you and your family a brighter future ahead Keep in mind, if you come here illegally without following the proper procedures, you could possibly end up like Jorge Garcia. And that's only one story out of the millions out there. Jorge Garcia was brought here at the age of 10 with his parents. They did their paperwork and they did for him as well. So he thought. He was only 10 at the time, practically still a child. He is now currently 39 years old. He has a wife and two children. It was a normal day for him and his family until out of nowhere, there were several knocks on the door. Slowly yet cautiously, he opened it. Then bam, out of nowhere, ICE was in the house, telling him that he was to be immediately deported back to Mexico. It was at this exact moment that he did not know whether to feel sad, mad, or even confused. He had a mix of emotions. His family hears the news. They're heartbroken and left devastated with many unanswered questions still to this day. So before anything gets out of hand, he packs his bags and kisses his family goodbye. Remember, this is only one story out of the millions out there. And out of these millions of people, 800,000 of them were signed up with DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Now, since DACA has currently been suspended, these people are living in fear. They practically live in the shadows. Now, to first start off with this process, you would start paying US taxes. After these taxes, you would then start, paying paper, start doing the paperwork. Now, you would think that getting paperwork approved would only take a couple of days or maybe even a couple of weeks. However, this is not the case. On average, illegal immigration paperwork takes a range from five to 10 years. 
after all these steps, you can finally make your move to America as a citizen. So remember, diversity shall not separate us as a nation, but it should bring us together as we embrace each other's ethnicities. Thank you. Good morning, judges, guests, and fellow contestants. Patriotism, what is it? Is it an action, a word, a concept? Maybe it's an emotion. Take a second, think about it. What is it? Everyone have their answers? All right, well, patriotism, to me at least, is all of these things. An action, a word, a concept, and an emotion that together unites us as we honor and respect one another. Patriotism is when people are unified, knit together by their devotion to one's country, or specifically each other. This can be done in many ways. One, being a humanitarian act, an act of benefiting others. Or, on a worse note, a horrific act of violence. Either one is rooted in honor and respect for one's country and each other. A humanitarian act. The flooding in Texas in August and the flooding in September in Puerto Rico us meeting the needs of those suffering from a natural disaster, joining out of concern and compassion for others. Food, clothing, and household items were sent from across the nation to those suffering from the natural disaster. Others were using their personal boats to rescue those threatened by the rising waters. A horrific act of violence. 9-11-2001 and the Las Vegas shootings in October are two examples of horrific, horrific acts of violence. People, brave first responders in 9-11, brave first responders, police officers and firefighters, risking their lives, not even a time of need, pain, or sorrow, do these men and women stop fighting in Las Vegas? There are people throwing themselves on top, of, on top of loved ones, even strangers, to shield them from the bullets. It grieves my heart that it took the loss of life. No, it took the loss of hope. For us to put aside our trivial disputes for a moment, just a second, so that we can rally together for just one common goal, to honor and respect one another. Have you ever heard of the name Peter Capaldi? He says something profound. Like, gave me a deeper understand, um, understanding of what it means to be a patriot. I quote, the men and women that serve us, they've fought in worse wars than we could ever imagine. They've done worse things than we could ever comprehend. When they close their eyes, they hear more screams than any of us could ever be able to count. And do you want to know what they do with all that pain, all that sorrow? They hold it tight till it burns and they tell themselves, no one will ever have to live like this. No one will ever have to feel this pain. Not on their watch. This quote impacted me personally. Some nights they're unable to sleep because they're willing to carry this burden. They're an inspiration to people every day, inspiring others to be brave as well. They're giving people hope. They're giving them something to believe in. Through their sacrifice, their patriotism deserves to be honored and respected. You probably know one, you may be one, or you may want to be one in the near future. As Americans, we should each show them respect and honor them, because no matter what, we are all humans, humans that make mistakes, grave mistakes, but humans that can forgive, humans that, make a better, that can make a better choice, a kinder choice, a choice to honor and respect one another as humans. So I ask you to make a choice, a better choice, a kinder choice, a choice to honor and respect one another. I shared at the beginning, patriotism is many things, an action, a word, a concept, and an emotion. These things unite us together, rooted in honor and respect. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm sure we are all familiar with Supergirl and Wonder Woman. What's their common denominator? 
they both have strength and power, just like our moms. Because women are not just a pretty face, but more than anything, they are loving, intelligent, confident, and brave. Just like what Elizabeth Staden said, the best protection a woman can have is courage. I'm Erica Maglalang, a young girl who thrives to make a difference in our continuously changing world. From my home country, the Philippines, my family migrated to America on a promise that a brighter future is waiting for us. Truly, greater opportunities are being presented, not just to my family, but to everyone who is pursuing their dreams. But then, women's suffrage was experienced in America in 1848. It only ended in 1920 when women finally earned the right to vote. Back then, women were only considered housewives. They weren't given the chance to go to school, to learn, because they were expected to get married, cook, and clean to keep their husbands happy. This was how it stayed until one day, three powerful ladies decided to stand up against the injustice happening to the woman population. They were Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Staden, and Lucy Stone. They paved the way for future generations of women to take a stand. And so, in 1848, the Declaration of Sentiments was drafted. As Thomas Jefferson stated, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. However, Elizabeth Staden emphasized that both women and men are created equal. Can you imagine living in a world where women are considered insignificant and unappreciated? 2018 is called the Year of Women. More females are using their voices to spread awareness. As Oprah said at the Golden Globes, that a new day is on the horizon. The powerful Malala Yousafzai also said, I raise up my voice, not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed if half of us are held back. The possibilities are endless. No one knows when that new day will come. But when it does, we women, including myself, will be standing tall, ready to greet it with open arms. I'm Erica, a future lawyer, wife, mother, and probably a grandmother. And because I live in America, my possibilities are as vast as the horizon. There is nothing to stop me from achieving my dreams. Instead, I should be the one to push forward positive change. You only live once. So why not do something that will make you be remembered, appreciated, and respected for generations to come? Now, let us ask ourselves, what sacrifice are we willing to endure for a better future? And what will be our legacy for others to remember? As for me, I believe that what I do now determines the direction of my future. Good afternoon, parents, judges, and fellow contestants. My name is Eva Cherian, and today we will travel back to one of the most horrifying dates in all of American history, September 11, 2001. Police sirens, buildings crumbling, people screaming. 
These were the sounds that filled the ears and terrorized the hearts of over 30,000 Americans on September 11, 2001. This horrendous state shook the foundations of America and stunned the rest of the world. Yet, among the anguished cries and heart-wrenching suffering, there are beacons of hope that were lights of, in the darkness for the distressed. Through the bravery, fortitude, and heroism of an equity officer, a singing veteran, and four passengers, America proved to the terrorists that even in desperate times that we will rise up and protect our people at all costs and we will not succumb to the terror that is inflicted upon our country. Wells Crowther, a 24-year-old equity officer, was on the 104th floor of the South Tower during the time of the attack. After making a phone call to his mother assuring that he was safe, Crowther ran all the way down to the 78th floor to save people. To the people covered in rubble and blinded by smoke, he was known as the man in the red bandana due to the bandana covering his face, preventing him from inhaling smoke. While saving over a dozen people in the sky lobby on the 78th floor of the South Tower, Crowther was calm and collected while encouraging people to stand and follow him to safety. Unfortunately, he lost his life, but through his heroic actions, Crowther brought hope to the dozen people he saved and inspired many others to do the same. Even though he lost his life, he died a hero. Meanwhile, in the South Tower, Rick Rascorla, a Vietnam War veteran, was on working as the head of corporate security under Morgan Stanley. When the plane hit the North Tower, Port Security ordered Rescorla to keep his men working at their desks. But Rescorla knew the severity of the situation and issued an immediate evacuation. And after years of evacuation drills, Rescorla and his employees were prepared, and over 2,700 people escaped before the plane hit their tower. All the while, Rescorla sang God Bless America and Men of Harlech to reassure and calm people. Yet in the end, he did not make it out alive either, and his body was never found. However, through the simple action of just singing, he was able to keep the people from panicking, thus saving the lives of over 2,500 civilians. The last group of heroes were four strangers that kept Flight 93 from crashing into the Capitol and endangering the lives of many citizens. After the crash of the towers, four Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked the plane and killed the pilot. While the mortified passengers said their final goodbyes to their loved ones over the phone, Mark Bingham, Tom Burnett, Jeremy Glick, and Todd Beamer huddled together and made a plan to overthrow the terrorists. Soon enough, the passengers joined in on the plan, and as they were fighting off the terrorists, the plane veered off course and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, killing all 44 passengers aboard. Even though they were just ordinary people, their heroism and sacrifice saved many lives and prevented our nation from going into mass hysteria. Just like the equity officer that pushed through smoke and rubble to save people, Russ Gorla, who sang to calm the panicked people, and a group of strangers who came together and saved our nation from crippling. We should dedicate our lives to our country. Patriotism isn't just saying the Pledge of Allegiance and serving jury duty. Patriotism is when you're willing to risk your life to save the country that blessed you with all that you have. Patriotism is when you put your hand on your heart and say with all your mind, I love my country. September 11th was a day of sadness and despair, but it gave many people the chance to really show how much they love their country. Through all the blood, tears, and mourning, there was a light in the darkness, hope in a place full of despair, and courage in a place of terror. Thank you. Roosevelt once said that freedom makes a huge requirement of every human being. With freedom comes responsibility. For the person who is unwilling to grow up, the person who does not want to carry his own weight, this is a frightening prospect. Everybody look to your left. Now look to your right. We are the future of the United States of America and together we can make a huge difference in the world. Good afternoon, judges, guests, and fellow contestants. My name is Frank Beard. 
What does every citizen in America need to do? Every citizen in America must work towards unity because the division that currently exists has led to many problems. Some of the issues we are having with other countries include war, trade disagreements, racial injustice, and just outright broken relationships. There is a battle within our borders, such as Democrats and Republicans, not working as a team in Congress, and everyday citizens getting violent and intolerant while debating with each other. There are people kneeling during our national anthem, violent protests occurring, unnecessary gun violence, and other actions taking place to try and divide our nation more and more. Every citizen in America needs to learn to work together regardless of one's religious affiliations, skin color, gender, personality, or any other God-given human aspects of a person. We cannot have preconceived judgments or profiling based on a person's education level, background, or anything else. It is okay to have disagreements. However, we must unite to come up with diplomatic solutions for our problems. Most people in America ask, what will our country do for us? But as John F. Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You can work hard to be a part of the unity solution and not the divider. Division leads to internal war, drug problems, broken families, bullying, violence, and ruined communities. It leads to a negative environment and encourages violence of many types and causes our neighborhoods to be unsafe or at a minimum, unfriendly. This discredits our country, which is well respected by the whole world, or at least it used to be. The direction we are currently going is not leading to a good place, but with you and me, us together, we can change course. Many people have immigrated to our great country in pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. I too have roots from many different parts of the world, mainly the Philippines, Russia, Germany, Ireland, and I'm even a registered Native American Indian and was born in Italy. Many of you also have roots from many different parts of the world, and that is what makes our country diverse and magnificent. This is the land of the American dream, which is slowly fading away. I challenge each and every citizen of America to stand up for what you believe in, for the improvement of our nation, but do it in a peaceful and friendly way. History tells us that people don't often realize what is really important in life until they face death. Do we really need to go through that much pain before we make changes in our life? I leave you with a few encouraging thoughts. Don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. But instead, live more, love more, serve more, give more, and appreciate life more. Let us unite in peace and love so that together we can again have the greatest country in the world.